So hi, Sebastian. So Sebastian is pronounced well? Yeah, it's, uh, you can say Sebastian. Sebastian? Or, uh, but, uh, ah, you're French. Sebastian, yeah. I'm French, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm half French, half Dutch, to be honest. Ah, okay. <laughs> so uh, my last name is Bean, but it could be Bien. Bien, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. e everyone is uh, nice to me in... in, 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 in uh, in France, I was one uh, once at the airport, and they saw my last name. Say, "Hey, your, your name is Bien." Then go first. So um, I was I was the absolute, you know, first in the row without any status information. So this was interesting. Oh, good. Awesome. <laughs> now to more important yeah. topics. What was your first computer? My first computer. Um, so uh, the first computer I used. It was not my computer, but it was the first computer I used was a Thomson M05. So I don't know if you know that. It's a French computer that were used in schools. Wow, never and heard uh, about this. Thomson, you yeah, say? Uh -huh. Tom, yeah, Thomson. Thomson M05. If you Google that, you will see it's uh, it's more or less, it looks like a bit uh, spec, uh, Spectrum uh, ZX. Uh, it was a really simple computer, but it was um, meant for schools mainly. And I was really lucky. My father was a teacher. And in the 80s, so it was in 85 or 80, 86, something like that, uh, the French government decided that every school should have computers. Uh, and it was a great plan. And um, And my father was really motivated about that. He didn't know anything about computers, but he knew it was important. So he bought a computer from school at home. Mm -hmm. And he, he told me, Sebastian, do you want to help me uh, set up the computer? And I said, sure. And so he, he, he turned on that computer and what appeared was a basic command line. And uh, he gave me a little leaflet with a lot of basic commands. And I just started typing randomly uh, commands. And my first command was, of course, print my first name. And I was really impressed. But how, and, but, but, but how, yeah. you knew, how you knew that the print was the right one? Oh, yeah. Because my father, before that, he had a one-week training a bit. And he learned about some of these basic commands. And he ah, told okay. me the, the first command, to print out your name, you can use the command print. And... And then the second one that he showed me was a command called box F with a lot of numbers parameters. And that was to just create a filled box with a color. And when I typed that command, then I really realized something. It was amazing. I could make yellow boxes, uh, green boxes. And for me, I didn't know exactly what I was typing. I didn't understood all these parameters. But one thing I was really understanding, um, I was already a big fan of video games. And for me, it was pure magic what was happening with the video games. But suddenly I realized that I could also make games because I could teach the computer what to do. And for me, that was really, uh, well, uh, we call that the mind storm is when you realize, uh, that you can teach a computer. So that was my really first experience, uh, with a computer and programming. Um, and, um, that, yeah. that's, that's actually interesting. So first, uh, you would be really happy with my computer. So it was Spectrum, but, um, I had a French manual. So what I couldn't understand oh. for other reasons. And, um, and my first command I found in the manual, actually, the first line which I started to type was rem, which was common. Oh. So nothing happened, actually. So I was really sad that I type a lot and nothing happens. And yeah, uh, yeah this was the first thing. And uh, the, the other question I have, um, were you somehow fascinated with the hardware? So not just what you can do, rather than about the hardware. So did you like, you know, the computer as a thing or just what you can a, do with it? Um, to be honest, at the, at the beginning, it was just about uh, what I could do with it. Uh, the passion uh, around the hardware came a bit later, uh, to be honest. Uh, for, for me, I was, it was the other way around. So at the beginning, okay, I was yeah. really fascinated by the quality of the hardware. It was like, you know, like a foreign thing. It's like what I can do with it. So it's really nice. I would really like to use it, but 
but but how you know this was okay a, yeah yeah okay okay, okay. And, uh, and uh another question i have so you started with the box f have you played games on the machine before or was it your first encounter with your computer oh it was my first encounter with the computer uh i, I really started discovering a computer by programming that so is, uh, this is remarkable yeah. this is really cool uh-huh yeah yeah and um but quite fast after uh, basic my father showed me another language which was called logo oh so, logo is great but uh what what you do with basic just boxes or something more you know usable yeah to no to be honest uh, from what i remember it was uh boxes playing with a bit with the goto command to go back and do yeah. boxes again you know but to be honest I, it was a bit uh, random random typing i i didn't master english i was i was eight so for me it was uh, and it was more really discovering though uh, no no it's uh, uh i really learned programming right after with logo because i could type in french i could type french commands logo in french so for me it was like oh yeah f, f yeah. Uh, how was it f f d was forward uh, i think no uh, uh, forward was fd uh it's still fd because i'm still programming in logo for <laughs> in my but, spare time but uh, but logo was not french right was it a french command no 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 it was translated to french ah, okay. translated okay especially for this uh, governance and plan for the schools, because they decided that kids should learn to code, which is awesome if you think about it in the year 80s. Mm -hmm. And so they created a French version of Logo. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, I could type avancé, that means uh, forward. I could, uh, it was uh, for turn left, it was tourné gauche. And uh, the repeat was répète. Okay, and... but there were the commands, as you're saying, but uh, uh, I, my logo, what I remember, they were abbreviations, were two letters always. Yeah, well, uh, both were possible uh, in my logo. I could type the abbreviation or the full uh, verb. Like for, for forward in French is avancé, I could type avancé, mm -hmm. or I could just type AV. Okay. That would work as well. So uh, I could, yeah. And and in my logo was uh, F F W or F D or something, right? Yeah, yeah. It's probably F D uh, of F W. Yeah, F D. I think so. Yeah, yeah F D. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, rotate was R T. Okay. And R T. Uh, yeah. So what you did was logo. Yeah, yeah. And that was really. Then I realized that what I the ideas I had in mind, like making a making a square and then a triangle to make it a, a looks like a house i could just type the commands and try it out and i was understanding what i was doing and uh yeah then i realized i think at that moment that i wanted to be a, a, a programmer later i think that really happened at that moment and uh yeah i did a lot of small programs um I did a lot of text-based adventure games, really simple, but yet uh, with uh, with logo. So uh, and um, yeah, logo was really a mindstorm for me. And uh, to be honest, a few years ago, just I... just back to the logo. I'm curious about one thing. So what you said, you you created a house with uh, the roof, yeah. which was triangle. Have you already yes. got the idea to have a function or method to rename, you know, the triangle to roof and reuse it? Yeah, actually, yes. You, you in logo, you have that concept of functions that are called procedures, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I created one procedure uh, called um, the house or something like that, and another mm -hmm. procedure called the roof. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I was calling these procedures uh, in an other procedure that created the house. So I really started to get the the, the concept of using functions. Yeah, yeah. because uh, yeah. I had similar experience with you, but not with logo, rather than with basic. And at the beginning, then uh, it was a little bit boring because how to tell? There was no like you know, sa time savings. You know, you had to write everything exactly down. But with the function, I got the idea you could actually write something once and then just yes. use it, reuse it. And then I got excited because I say, okay, the idea is you can compose things. You can just, you know, if you are, let's say, uh, 
you have some time, you, you can create things, and then you can just reuse them later. And this is how, how I really like the idea of programming. Yeah, yeah, me too. And the other thing with function is when I learned that I could pass a parameter. So like for a square, mm -hmm. I realized that I could pass the length of the square. Mm -hmm. And then reusing the same function, I could do squares for of any size I wanted. And um, that is also when I started to make uh, loop functions to, to create squares that, that goes bigger and bigger. Um, yeah, and that was the other thing that I really liked when I discovered that I can use parameters and the whole concept of variables, I think. Uh, that was also I really cool I think in basic it was not possible. I think I had to declare uh, you know, uh, uh, variables, which were global, and then call something. I think it uh, No, oh, go, okay. go to line. No, in exactly. In in basic, I think there were no procedures, at least not in my basic. You only had to to go to line, and you could reuse something with go sub. So you you know you have like line ten thousand. So oh yeah. You can go sub, and then we we'll jump back. This was the the concept of reuse. Okay. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So, so yeah, logo was more logo was logo was actually more advanced than basic. I think so, yes. Yeah. Yes, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you know A ACS logo? ACS logo? No, I'm not sure. You, um, uh, I think the name is ACS or ASC logo. This is like a logo implementation for the Apple. You can. This is open source. You can download it right now. Oh, okay. And this okay. is uh, this is actually pretty advanced. Uh, you can you can oh. do crazy stuff with it. So it, you can let it speak. You have access to you know to the operating system. So uh, I was really amazed by that. Okay, what, what I'm using, I'm, I'm on Linux on Fedora, and there is a UBC logo, I think, from the Berkeley University, mm -hmm. and it's also a logo implementation, and uh, yeah, I think it's fully implemented, and it's worth pretty nice, I launched it from the console, and... Uh, hey, cool. And you can uh, you, yeah. and you can invoke uh, a, a system. You can you can uh, invoke something from operating system as well, or is fully emulated. Mm, uh, to be honest, I haven't checked that out. If I can, mm, like, that's something I must check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but, like, uh, like top, for yeah. instance, you know, see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, logo, what I do uh, I, sometimes I show logo in at uh, conferences, folks. And what I do, I found an emulator of this. Uh, first computer that I mentioned, the MO5. There's okay. a French guy that created an emulator for it. Mm -hmm. And so I can also load the logo inside that. And when I do my live coding demos, I do it using the emulator. And uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. So, uh, because it even emulates the old sounds of the keystrokes when you press a key. Uh, uh, I really like that. Uh, therefore, uh, I get some sometimes asked at conferences whether I also need sound, and I say never. And this is because of you, because you know you <laughs> you bring the emulators, and uh, you know the poor technical guys have to you know uh, provide you a uh, sound environment as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's it's getting easier now with HDMI. Often the sound is. Uh... It's included, but yeah. That's yeah, but the I, only moment I, I, I always get the sound. question. Yeah. I always get the question uh, whether I also need sound. They also, yeah, that's always, true. Yeah. 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 Always. I always get the question as well. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So now, uh, after logo, what do you do? After then? logo. So uh, after that, I got my real first computer, home computer. So that was uh, an Amstrad PC 1512. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was uh, a PC. Uh, I remember no hard disk, mm -hmm. just one floppy disk driver and uh, PGA. Uh, and what I did on this computer, well, it was still doing logo. I found a logo for PC and I still play with logo. My really next language was a few years later when I got an Amiga. Wait a sec. And, uh, uh, what was the most impressive things you did back then with logo? The most impressive things I did, um, I think it was what I told you before, some text-based adventure games where I described where the, the person was. You are in a castle. You can now go south or north. You okay. can grab an object. And it was, to be honest, was pretty simple. But uh, yeah, I was already pretty pr proud of, of, of that. Yeah, cool. And, how, uh, how old yeah. were you? I was probably 10. 
Python, something like that, when I start to be, make my real first program. Yeah. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And so a few years later, I got an uh, other Amiga. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I discovered a language called Amos. I don't know if you know that. Never heard Amos. Uh, Amos, Amos. Amos. Uh, it's it's based it's based on on basic. I think it's a fork of basic, but more specific for writing games because mm -hmm. it has a concept of sprites of uh, scrolling the screen. And uh, yeah, then I had a lot of fun as well. Uh, I make really simple little games. Uh, to be honest, I really never finished them. <laughs> I had a lot of ideas, <laughs> to be honest, and I always started a lot of projects and then I started with something else. But that language was really cool because with, with Amiga, you had great graphics, great sounds. Was, it was better than the PC I had at the same time. So uh, uh, I had a lot of fun with that. And uh, the really first serious program I did with Amos was actually not a game, but was a software for my mother. Uh, so I was probably 14, and my mother was a nurse, uh, a free, uh, I think you say a freelance nurse. She was working for her own, and she had a lot of clients uh, every day and a lot of paperwork. And, okay. uh, and she had to do that, to fill in all these papers by herself, and that was taking her two, two full days, and it was crazy. And I said, hey, wait, I think I can fix that. So... I created a really simple software program where she could select her client, some, uh, enter some, some data, and then just put a paper in the printer and it printed out, uh, the paper with all the information on it. And actually it worked really well. And uh, it could, uh, it, now instead of spending two days, she just spent two hours printing out this stuff and it was working. So that was the moment that I realized I, I liked to program that that I actually could do things that were useful for people, and uh, yeah, I was really proud because yeah, you know, it was yeah, sure. it was for my mother. So yeah. it was what was better, the deal? So. You didn't have to do dishes, or you didn't have to clean your room <laughs> then. So no, no, no deals. I, I just <laughs> did that because I liked it, and uh, so you yeah, were just I, nice, uh, a nice kid. Yeah, right? yeah, was just a nice kid, exactly. So. Um, so, and, was, so uh, now, but this was more advanced. So you, back then, if you had the um, client addresses or just addresses, you had to store them somewhere. So I assume there was kind of uh, of database or you had to, to, to write to files, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and yeah, I heard previous guests that they all say from your podcast that they all say they have made their own database. Well, that was the same for me. I, yeah. Hey, I never I, had I, the Larry, <laughs> Larry Ellison on the podcast. I assume he would say, no, I hated databases. I did something else. <laughs> but, but, but everyone else uh, pretty much starts with a database, right? Exactly. And I'm trying to remember how, how I was storing that, that I was, yeah, probably storing that to the disk. Uh, it was really custom made because, yeah, I, to be honest, I had no idea about databases at that point. And uh, which I did which all programming myself. language was it? Still Amos? Still Amos. Yeah, still Amos. Because, yeah, you could, uh, and it was nice because you could, with Amos, you could already create uh, um, user interface with menus with the, that you could reach with the mouse and stuff like that. So it was it was pretty advanced. It was not a command line app. It was really an app with a user interface uh, where you could click and select. And uh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, and you played games as well as Kit, or we just was the... yes. Okay. Yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, uh, it sounded to me like you were not the perfect Kit. Just, you know, helps the, the, the <laughs> mother no, just... No, no. Uh, no, so you also played. What, what was your favorite uh, yeah, game? My favorite game? Uh, my favorite game is probably uh, it's a, a LucasArts game, uh, a click adventure game called Zack McCracken. I don't oh, know really? if you know it. Yeah. Um, and, and back then, back then, I mean, did the game run already on, on your first game, on the Thompson? No. No, 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 not on the Thompson. No, what was no, on the no, Thompson? Thompson? Were the games at all at the Thompson? Yeah, I think there were some games that they were pretty bad. I didn't play that. I oh, this is what I, I played. Thought. Yeah, yeah, I played games at um, 
so I didn't have a, 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 a console to pay, but my grandparents had a console. No kidding. Crazy. Really? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they had a, a, a Philips video pack, which is a pretty old console. And uh, yeah, I think one of the first games I played was Pac-Man on that. And uh, yeah, that there were. And Pac-Man is still one of yeah, it's still one of my favorite games. Uh, I still yeah. play it yeah, weekly. Cool. I think. <laughs> So now, uh, what I remember, I also wrote a database in one point of time with Tubo Pascal, and this was not like a database. You could easily write binary, the content of something to a disk and reload it. This is what I did back then, and it worked pretty easy. So I wrote, you know, the whole data structure to disk and read it from floppy disk. This is what I oh, did. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, for... Just speaking about games, I think we all did that. What I did sometimes was breaking up the, 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 the binary code of the of a game to, to change some stuff and to How have you did it? infinite. Oh, I did that. Uh, not on my own because I was just buying magazines and they said, ah, okay, okay. Oh, <laughs> go to this, <laughs> to this line, to this row, replace F22 by, I don't know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then, <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. And uh, uh yeah, that was with the Amiga and um then I got a newer PC a few years later, uh uh a German computer by the way, a Siemens Nixdorf. Uh, I remember. Uh, but for... this is this is strange that you got the but this was PC, right? That was a PC, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh uh for uh, for uh, 86 uh, DX266. Okay. And uh what did I I think I did a bit of quick basic at that time again. Uh, uh, um, one 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 short question. What was the CPU of your of the Amstrad? You remember that? Was it uh, Intel or something else? <laughs> I, I think it was Intel. I think it was an Intel. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, pro probably two two sixty sixty eight or something, right? Two eighty six. Yeah, yeah, I mean, probably two eighty six or uh, what I had. No, four. I had oh, yeah. eighty eighty six was my first one. Yeah. yeah, it could be something like this. So it was the before. I think it was the first, and then the next one was the two eighty six, three eighty six. Then the six. four and the X was four. like a little bit uh, faster, and then the pen yeah, yeah. came out, right? Yeah, yeah, extension came out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and um, yeah, I did a bit of quick basic. Um, I also used another software to do some 3D ray tracing. Uh, so it was called Puff Point of View, I think. And it was a language where you can describe your 3D uh, cube, for instance. And you decided where the light was coming from, and it was all scripted. And then you had to render to render it, and it was rendering the whole night. And in the morning, you arrived and you had a nice 3D cube with with the lightning, with the texture on it. And um, I I played a bit with that, but uh, yeah, it was taking too much time to render, so I, I got <laughs> quickly bored about that. Probably this was the predecessor of uh, Blender, right? Exactly, exactly. But um, I really liked the fact that it was uh, you had to script it. Uh, I think there was some user interface later for that, but I really liked just was just opening a text file and uh, entering your comments there and let it render. Hey, so, cool. Yeah. So and then, uh, uh, what what was the most impressive impressive thing you did with QBasic? Was QBasic? Um, well. I'm not sure it was that impressive, but I remember it was at school uh, when I was maybe now 15 or, uh, yeah, I was probably 15. Uh, there were, we had some, it was not in math class, but something like te uh, engineer uh, class, they, they did that. And with a friend, we did a whole software that will, uh, where you could enter all your marks for each class you had. Um, and it will calculate for you, uh, your, uh, how you do all that, um, average. your average, exactly. Mm -hmm. And taking into account, uh, each class, uh, has a different weight and stuff like that. 
and at, uh, and we did that together and it was working really well and uh, the teacher was impressed and that I think that's the only memory I have about a, a quick basic program I did but uh, yeah but I still remember it so it was pretty important for me I think yeah cool so you you uh, you became better at school with the program I guess right yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool exactly. so what was the next language uh, so the next language, um, then let me think. I think I, I, I program a bit on my, on my calculator. I had the Texas Instruments CI 99. I think it was, I think it was Pascal on this calculator, mm -hmm. to be honest. And there I, I wrote some games, but to be honest, I, I had a book with just code listing and that mm -hmm. I was retyping. And I had some cool, cool games on my calculator that we I could play during the class. <laughs> so, but um, but the calculator could store uh, the programs already. Yeah, the calculator could store, and I had a pretty big screen. So I had to, I remember the, the the game I was playing was uh, you have a it's a ballistic game where you have two can cannons and you have a mountain in the middle and you have to orient cannon right and the power right. And you had to hit the other cannon, uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. and yeah, and that was a game that we ca could play with uh, at, with with another <laughs> with another friend. So we were playing that in the in the during boring classes. <laughs> you had in France something like a boring class. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Believe me, <it's> something. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so cool. <laughs> Next, so TI. Interesting. And uh, how old were you already? Sixteen? Yeah, sixteen. I was sixteen. Yeah, yeah. And oh. um, and after that, uh, to be honest, I did it a bit. Some years I didn't did anything around coding. Uh, you know, I was a, a teenager playing guitar, hanging out with friends, and which songs? Uh, what What do you practice? Song? Oh, I so um, I practiced guitar uh, when I was sixteen, but before that, I played clarinet, uh, classic clarinet, for okay. fifteen years. So, but uh, yeah, I was playing the guitar. I was a real grunge. I was a Nirvana fan. A real oh, fan. I'm still, <laughs> yeah, I'm still a fan to be honest. Smells and like Teen Spirit. Exactly, and we have a we had a band. We were playing and uh, having a lot of fun, and. Um, you had you had fans? Yeah, some fans. We were not that famous, but yeah, I was uh, I was living on the countryside in a small village, so uh, yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, and uh, after that, after high school, I started the university, um, not in IT, to, to be honest, because I was not good enough in math and in science, and it's really hard in France. So. Actually, you know why? Comics? You know why? I think this comes from the canon on your calculator. You know. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. <laughs> you should I didn't focus on the, on, on the numbers, <laughs> not on the canons. This was uh, no, the, the focus was not right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, um, and so I studied economics, and um, I even have a master in economics. Cool. Uh, but yeah, and during my year of economics, there was a new engineer school that opened uh, in the city next to me, and they decided to also take people that were that had no science background. Mm -hmm. And and I said, oh, that's that's the opportunity for me to to do what I really want to do. So I could join this engineer school, mm -hmm. and there uh, there I started to learn Java. Mm -hmm. uh, they did Java in this school. And um, that's how I started okay. programming in Java. Which version of Java was it? You remember that? Uh, I don't know. It was in two thousand two. So okay. Maybe one dot one dot two one or one one dot two something like that. One, one two or one three because uh, yeah. One three yeah maybe one three yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, and you like Java immediately, or it was su yeah. somehow suspect for you? No, no, I like it. I, I, it was pretty clear for me how it worked. And, and, you, uh, and, and you got the idea of the Java virtual machine from the beginning? Or was it strange that you have to run 
your programs with Java something? No, it was pretty clear, but because we, our teachers explained it really okay. clearly to us and, uh, there, uh, we had really good teachers, right? So they started to, to show us Java to explain us, um, what object oriented programming was. Uh, we did a lot of UML at the, at the moment back. Oh, of course. Uh, of and, course. Uh, and, and you liked yeah. UML? Oh. Well, to be honest, he, yes, and j just the, you know, the, 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 the <laughs> how would you call that? The, the one where you just represent the classes and the, and everything. Class diagram. Uh, that was, uh, the class diagram, exactly. That was the one that, yeah, I could understand it. And uh, the sequence diagram was also pretty useful. I assume and, uh, you, yeah. you've wrote a, a logo procedure who draw the class diagrams, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I, I could have done that. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> it, it could yeah, work. Yeah, Actually, yeah. this was a perfect case for logo. You know, UML. Exactly. Logo. Yeah. Oh yeah, I see that the the the, the turtle uh, doing the sequence diagram or. <laughs> yeah, this was the rational rose logo edition. Yeah, yeah, it's the rational rose <laughs> logo edition. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool. So. so uh, yeah, and uh, in the second year, uh, we started to learn Java EE uh, even. No uh, kidding. And that was pretty, uh, yeah, well, uh, we, they, they introduced us to struts and to hibernate and to HBs. And uh, so that was for me completely new. And, but um, I assume you used Jonas, right? Application server. Oh, uh, Yes, that's true. Now that you tell me that, Jonas, we, yeah, some of the people were using Jonas. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I remember that I, I was invited to Java user group. I, I think around, I would say 10 or, or eight years ago. And Jonas was very popular. And, and I say still Jonas and I know it from, 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 from early days. And, and, and the reason is that Jonas comes with French documentation. Yes. And it was, it is, uh, I don't know whether still, but like we say, eight years ago was very popular in France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Cool. Uh, so, so you like yeah, the was... struts and the, the server side or? Yes, yes. I, I, I remember, uh, I really liked Hibernate. Uh, mm -hmm. it was really for me, uh, something new and I could really understand the benefits of it and, uh, yeah, I like it. And uh, trust, trust, to be honest, was really, I didn't got it in the beginning what, what I could use trust for. I didn't have quite a concept of the MVC pattern in, in mind. Mm -hmm. And that, and that came slowly when you, I started to do projects and, uh, assignments and then, yeah, oh, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, so, so that's how I started with, uh, yeah, with Java. And, um, at the end of my engineer school, we had a six months, uh, training. Uh, we had to go in a company for a training and I went in a really small company and my mentor, he was, uh, totally into design patterns. He just discovered, uh, spring. So. In, back in 2004 and uh, uh say it again so your mentor uh, so you meant uh, i just lost you for 10 seconds so um your mentor uh yeah like spring and uh, design patterns you say in 2004 right yeah yeah design patterns and he was also with this um framework uh tapestry you yes. remember that mm -hmm. yes so he was really into tapestry hibernate and spring so uh, I learned a lot of, from that as well at that moment. Uh, I discovered a lot of things. And um, yeah, after that, uh, the, the week I finished my engineering school, the week after I was hired in a, in a small company in the, in the Netherlands. I, so uh, I moved back to the Netherlands. Okay. And, uh, and I worked there for a small IT shop. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, I stayed there for seven years, and I wow. did a lot of. S S A G T. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Uh, 
I work mainly for insurances and banks. So mm -hmm. I did a, a lot of projects, a lot, to be honest, a lot of interesting projects for me uh, was learning. And uh, yeah, I remember my first assignment was for, uh, for a big Dutch bank. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, and we did a whole project using struts. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a lot of jet speed. I don't know if you remember the portal framework. Jet that speed was, still... was a turbine, and uh, this was the uh, Apache portal, it, it, and this was the same like exactly. the IBM, like the IBM portal. Exactly, and that was really hype at the, during this uh, time. So uh, I did a lot of projects around that as well. And um, yeah, that for seven years I've been doing that, and um, yeah, after a few years I came back to France. I worked for another company, and a few years later I got an opportunity to join a Red Hat. And, um, when was it with Red Hat? Red Hat. It was in 2012. I oh, joined okay. Red Hat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, what was your impression of J2E? So you did a lot of work with J2E uh, seven years. So you liked it or not? Or yeah, I liked it. Uh, I um, yeah, to be honest, um, the, everything we needed was in the application server. Uh, yeah. We had some hard time during some projects uh, when we were using Webster. I remember, I remember some crazy class loading issues with. I think with uh, the XML parser, uh, how is it called? Um, Xerces. Um, Xerces. Yeah, Xerces. Probably Xerces that was shipped with WebSphere, but was not the same version as what we had in the project. And uh, yeah, I remember we had some hard time and uh, um, funny moments. Uh, we, it was also the moment that we discovered uh, Maven, that we refactor our whole project to Maven. And that was that was quite a big thing to 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 have your dependencies somewhere else and don't have to worry to have them somewhere on your disk or <laughs> that was <laughs> I remember this moment and um, yeah I was I was really happy with the Java E and hmm. to be honest I'm still I'm still happy with Java E yeah so, um, yeah, and yeah the question is um, how you got the opportunity to work for Red Hat so what happened. Yeah, what happened? So, um, so at the, um, when I was still in the Netherlands, uh, even if I was doing Java EE at work, uh, in my free time, I was also really involved in the Groovy and Grills community. You know, the Grills? Or yeah, Grails. This was like Grails. Rails with. Groovy. Yes, exactly. And you could write plugins for that. And uh, it was the moment that the first iPhone came out and mm -hmm. mobile web apps were really getting popular. And I remember I wrote a, a plugin to easily create a, a mobile web front end for your girls app. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, some tag libs, some, some utility stuff. And that plugin got pretty popular. And that's where I also started to to public speaking about it. And um, so that was more or less at the same moment that Reddit decided to invest in mobile and they started a new mobile team. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were an opening there. Uh, and so I got hired at Reddit to work on the mobile uh, team. And um, so was it this arrow I, Is it arrow keys? I, I, Ah, gear, exactly. So the, then you the know the Matthias Wessendorf properly, right? Oh, Matthias. Matthias is a really good friend of me. Yeah, hey, cool. Yeah, so are. greetings to him. Yeah. So I also know him yeah. for a long time because we met a lot at, at various conferences. Yes, yes. Now, it's a, we, I, I met him first the, during when joining this team. And yeah, and now it, it became a, a really close friend. So. Yeah, and Matthias really uh, likes JSF and uh, Java server faces. Exactly, and, and, exactly, yeah. 
yeah, yeah. I'm just just kidding. Probably no more, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> whenever I see him, it's like, what's about Java server faces? <laughs> server faces, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. He's one of the guys that uh, like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm joking. No, um, and, uh, I, um, I have yeah. to say, I also like this because uh, if you are pragmatic, if you are still pragmatic, uh, JSF are really great. The problem where they were completely misused in 70% of our projects. And uh, this was the problem, but uh, yeah, but still. Uh, yeah. It's a nice topic to have lots of fun with, you know. So, yes, yes, yes. And so, with uh, yeah, in this team, I worked a lot with Matthias. Matthias, we worked on the unified push server, which was a server component to mm -hmm. send push notifications to mobile phones. Mm -hmm. And we abstracted that, that no matter if it's an Android, an iOS, a Windows phone, we were a central point where we unify that messages. And uh, so, Someone that was building his app, he could just send one unified push message to our server, and we will take care of sending that to the different platforms for Android and etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was the project, the, the main project on which we worked on, and that was yeah, that's really great for me. I really discovered also the the, the working in an open source uh, team, and um, I really liked that. And uh, so I worked on that team for a few years, and uh, then a new project appeared at, at the Red Hat called Keycloak, mm -hmm. and uh, I really liked that. Why? And I was, this is a completely different, uh, different category of project, so why you like that? I liked that because it was uh, solving an, an issue that we all have, we as developers, and especially middleware developers. We don't like to write security stuff. Yeah. We, we, we do it, we, we do it because we have to do it at one moment of the project because it's critical, but we don't like to do it. And, uh, if someone else can do it, can take care of that for you. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, why not? And it was. And and then so you decided it, because no one likes that, so I will do it full time, right? <laughs> exactly. No, because <laughs> exactly, but that's true. Because I like I, I, I you know, I I'm a public speaker. I do that because I share my knowledge and I like to solve issues for people and learn some new stuff. And I thought, well, that project is great. And uh, if I can join the team and spread the, the knowledge and and solve that issue for all the developers, um, I'm, it's a challenge for me. I really want to do that. So, so there was an opening again in that team, and I joined the Keycloak team. And that was uh, three years ago now, I think. And yeah, to to be honest, I don't regret it at all. It's such an amazing project and the community is huge around it and um yeah i can see even if security sounds like a boring subject when at the conference you say okay i'm going to solve your issue you don't like security you do it you do it at the end of your project and you always implement it in a bad way okay listen to me i have something really nice there's almost nothing to do you just have to unzip the keycloak server configure it you have to configure your app a bit to just uh, tell them how to, to discuss with the Keycloak server, and you're done. Your whole user management authentication flows is handled for you using the best practices and relying on on, on well-known protocols. It's not a homemade solution. Because mm -hmm. so, yeah. it sounds almost like a religion, you know. So if uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have lots of sins, come to me afterwards. We can uh, clear it up. Exactly. It's a solution is Kiko. Yeah. Uh, one question. Why you didn't start it with PicketLink? Because PicketLink um, was before Kicklock, right? Yes, yes. Well, uh, to be honest, at Idaho Gear, we were using PicketLink at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, we were using even for our unified push server. Uh, but at the, that moment, I was still really, really involved with the push server. That, so I was not really looking for okay. something else. And Keycloak appeared at the moment that I was, I, I liked still the, the mobile project, but I was looking for something else. Okay. So it's just a matter of time. And now PicketLink is uh, end of life, right? 
exactly. Perfect. Exactly. So Keycloak the... is the only uh, solution that has. Now, now let's talk about key, uh, Keycloak first. From from uh, my observations, so Keycloak is like a war, which is uh, which ships with uh, JBoss. So usually, you would use Whitefly. So Keycloak is a Whitefly in a war in in a project, a Java projects, right? Which provides you more or less security as a service. So first, this was from you know very rough yeah. technical rough, observation, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, technical, yeah, it's not really a war. We we had a war distribution for a while, but now it's really uh, uh, a, a subsystem of uh, bundled with a Wildfly, and we ship it as that. Yeah, we, so now it's more than war, so it's a tightly integrated with the Wildfly. And uh, yes, yes, yeah, so you, you get, uh, you know, like a Wildfly server with Keycloak inside. So this is Keycloak, right? And uh, yes, exactly, and that is key. Yeah, and Keycloak is a service. It yeah. runs somewhere. And uh, first yeah. thing, which what it does is it, uh, it manages users and roles somewhere in an internal database for pl if you would like to play with it or in an external database if you have serious data, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You, you it just relies on, uh, on uh, Hibernate and uh, you define your data source. So it can run... Uh, you decide where you store the data. We we support Postgres and MySQL, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you store it where wherever you want. The and and the first killer use case for me is you can manage the users in Keycloak, and you can now manage the passwords and say uh, when the password expires, when it have to be repeated, and all the stuff is is uh, is provided for you, right? Exactly. We have a whole set of policy passwords. Uh, so by default, even even if you don't touch anything by default, your password will be hashed and stored securely. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can, yeah, you can create a lot of rules like uh, don't use the previous password, uh, yeah. password length, and, uh, and all this stuff, right? Password length, whatever you want, you yeah. can, and it's and it's all manageable by uh, the, the 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 web console as well. So mm -hmm. can, yeah, exactly. So yeah. you can actually the first thing you get is. User management, user interface. So you could you could use Quasi this key cloak to manage users, right? Exactly. Yeah. And this is already a huge win because you don't have to implement it by yourself. So I was recently in a project and they wanted to have exactly that, and uh, this is actually a lot of work just you know to implementing the UI. Oh yeah, yes, just a, yeah, yeah, exactly. If you think just about the UI, you have to create a, a, reg a registration form, a login form, and then you. At the back end, you have to create these tables in your database. You have to, to handle the, 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 the authentication flows. Uh, you have to store the password. How do you store the password by yourself? Uh, you, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to say that a lot of people will still store it in clear text. So uh, that are all security matters, matters that you don't have to care anymore, yeah. anymore about. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I don't know whether, I think even for user management, there is a REST interface, which you can use as well. So you can actually implement your own API, which accesses via REST, talks to Keycloak, right? Exactly. So everything that you see on the web console is exposed as REST as well. So yeah. you can, and uh, we even have a Java client uh, that, uh, that encapsulates this API. So if you have a process where you need to create users in a batch, uh, you have a Java API that you can use in your small utility project, for instance, that creates the users for you. So, yeah. Yeah. So you could use the Jaxores uh, client to talk directly to you, which is a little bit cumbersome. Or not cumbersome. You have to implement it by yourself. Or you can use ready-to-use Java client, which is not a user interface rather than an API, which you can use yeah. to talk to yeah, TikTok. I Exactly, exactly. And, and they will use yeah. the REST behind the scenes, so HTTP and... Uh, uh, behind the scenes, it just uses the REST API, exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very cool. So the user, uh, th this was the, the first uh, killer use case, what I explained, if I would like, you know, to use Keycloak or when we find where the Keycloak is useful. And then, so we have the users. And uh, the Keycloak started, I think, with the use case of the realms. So if you have an application server, the application server manages the uh, groups and roles uh, internally, but most of the application servers allows you to swap the security realm. And what you could exactly. do, you could install on the application server kind of proxy realm, which talks remotely yes. to Keycloak. And then for you, it seems like all the roles and users are 
managed by your application server or stored on your application server, but actually uh, everything happens on Keycloak, right? Exactly. So if we take the, the, the Java EE or the Wildfly adapter, that we call it an adapter, mm -hmm. you install that on your application server and then in your web.xml, uh, where you, you just keep doing the same thing as you did before, defining your security constraints, etc. The only thing you change is the login method tag. And there, uh, usually it's basic or I don't know. And here you specify Keycloak and that's all you have to do. And as you said, you, you don't change anything as you were used to do. Uh, but it's all delegated to Keycloak. So your security constraints, if you hit, uh, a URL pattern defining your security constraints and you are not logged in, well, then your app will redirect to Keycloak, show you the login page and you log in. And it's with the rescue back. And, uh, yeah, and it's working. And in your servlet, you can access the Keycloak security context. And from there, you can access, uh, well, the user, uh, principle, the roles, whatever you want. And it's, uh, for every adapter, we try as much as possible to plug into the existing security, um, layer that already, that already exists. Mm -hmm. So for uh, Java E, uh, for the latest versions, we plug with Elytron. Uh, with Tomcat, we plug into the Valve, you know. So uh, we mm -hmm. try to make that much as transparent as possible. Mm -hmm. And what's uh, also okay. interesting is um, uh, this is uh, um, nice because um, there is, of course, some overhead. So the user has to be checked over and over again. So you also provide some... Uh, server side or client side caching. So on the server, you can specify how often the roles and so forth are checked, right? Yes, exactly. Um, and even, yeah, w that's where we provide also a single sign on. It, once you are logged in, we create a session with Keycloak. And if you open another tab and you access another application that, that still runs in your, in the same realm, you won't have to log in again. Yeah, and uh, this is what I wanted also to say. So what you could probably, is, well, not probably what you can actually do is you can run Whitefly with the Keycloak adapter, then Payara with the Payara adapter and Open Liberty with different adapters uh, or the yes. generic adapter. And uh, you can then three microservices running on three different application servers and every of the application server will talk back to the same Keycloak instance and then you get single sign-on between microservices, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. So we talk to the same Keycloak server, and to be more precise, we, call, we talk to the same realm. So in Keycloak, you create a realm, mm -hmm. and in your realm, there can be, yeah, different applications. And Yeah, yeah. and, and, and a realm exactly. is just it's just fancy name for a database of users which belongs to an, to an app or not. It's like, a, like, a, like, like a schema in a database. It's like uh, in security, it's called realm, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. It's uh, just a fancy name, yeah. Uh, uh, even the, the word realm for me is difficult to say in English. I, I talk about territory. Keycloak yeah. can have different territories, and in each territory, there are different applications and different users that are isolated uh, from the other territories. And yeah, that's, uh, that's how I explain it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good explanation for me. Is territory is already a more, let's say, security, security like, right? And, and for me, it's just exactly. the realm is like, uh, just a database, an uh, instance of a database which belongs to me, but I could also share it with others. But I can say this in this database, I store the users' roles, uh, and this is basically it uh, users and groups, and this is basically it, right? Exactly, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Users and, and, and application. You, so you define the client in Keycloak, a client can be any app, can be a front end app, a microservice, and uh, a Wildfly, and you declare that as a client in mm -hmm. Keycloak. So and the good. session could be actually optional because I could pass my credentials over and over again, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, so even uh, for a microservice, it doesn't need a it doesn't need a, a session because you have your microservice running and your web app obtain a token from Keycloak, and, mm -hmm. and then it just make a request to this microservice and just pass the token. And this microservice can uh, off we said it offline. It can verify the token to check if it's yeah, uh, uh, but, but authenticated. Uh, yeah. Start with the legacy scenario. So I have three applications, and if you talk about the session, you mean HTTP session with JSession ID or specific uh, key clock session? 
Uh, the, the J session ID. Yeah. Yeah. So I could pass the J session ID to Kicklock, and then I'm uh, I'm known to everyone who knows the J session ID. This will be the first simplistic case, right? Yes. And how it's called in Kicklock? This is called like HTTP session, or what? What is the name in Kicklock in the kind of configuration? Uh, you remember that? Uh, I don't know how we if we have a specific name for that. To okay. Be uh, yeah, yeah. So I call it legacy approach. So now um, this is u- <laughs> useful, for instance, for Matthias Wessendorf, right? If he would like to go with JSF, they are, they, they are stateful. So uh, they will create a J session ID, and the session ID would be uh, you know, passed to the backend. And uh, then in the backend, we have uh, the Kicklog knows that it comes f- from us, right? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And uh, the modern apps or batch apps or microservice or headless apps don't have such a concept as an HTTP session. So we have no yes. problem right now. So we have different possibilities. And I think the first one would be OAuth with the OID, right? This is called OCID yeah. or how it's called? I forgot. And o- this... o- it's OpenID Connect, OIDC. OIDC, exactly. So and this exactly. o- OIDC means this would be like uh, a play as instead of J session, we use another session, and the session is called OIDC, and we pass the OIDC token back and forth, right? Exactly. It's a, it, OIDC is just on top of OAuth two, and it uh, brings the, the the concept of identity, and basically it it gives you tokens, uh, JWT tokens, so JWT tokens. But but JWT are optional. I could go with OIDC all the time, right? So, and JSON Web Token is just a different, I would say, a level on top of that, right? Yeah, yeah. O- o- OIDC is the protocol, and uh, and JSON Web Token is the defined. payload. Yeah, it's the payload. Yeah, exactly. So, and uh, you have from the technical point of view, just to understanding. So, we have the legacy, and we have the we have the uh, realms on the application servers in the legacy mode. There was no additional configuration needed because you just told the application server use the Kicklock realm and the application server was in charge of decoding, encoding, or whatever. In the OIDC case, I think we will have to install a separate filter, container request filter, or another filter, right? So we have to do something. Uh, no, the, the, the adapter will take care of that. Uh, it works with the, the If you install the, the, the Wildfire adapter, uh, it works fine with the OIDC flow as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. You don't have to do anything. You, you even get your your token uh, injected. You can inject your token in your in your servlet and access it. And uh, yeah, there's nothing else to do. Okay, but what I remember in Kicklock, there were two possibilities. First was was like to install the proxy realm, and this was just this was it, and everything else happened on the application server. And the second possibility is to uh, technically install servlet filters or uh, yeah servlet filters basically which uh, took over the authentication author- and authorization yeah yeah so we have a servlet filters for the say it again you have servlet filters for what for which you, we don't I lost have you. an adapter with logic you have servlet filters for what yeah yeah it's sorry for application servers for which we don't provide an adapter because we have a specific wildfly adapter or jbot eap adapter mm-hmm uh, but uh, for web server, we don't have an adapter. Mm-hmm. It's called the servlet filter. Yeah. Uh, and but but to be honest, what we tr- what we try to to push forward now is we have a, another component that is called the Kiko gate, Gateway, mm-hmm. which is uh, a, a small sidecar proxy that you can put in front of your app. And so it could be a, it could be a Webfair app, it could be a Cobol mm-hmm. or a PHP app. Doesn't matter. It's it's following the sidecar pattern, and you put that in front of your app, and it will take care also of redirecting you to the login page, um, putting useful information in the headers of the request for the app. And so that's the way we try to to tell people. If you don't have the Keycloak adapter for your app, uh, you can put this gateway in front of your it's app. It's actually a great idea. And, and how the gateway is implemented? Is it a another service? Is it a war file? Or what is it? It's a, it's a Go app. Ah, okay. I thought about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, it was, uh, it's pretty nice. It was uh, contributed by the community, and we took the project over uh, last year. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, and, yeah, it's a Go app. So it's really small, uh, low memory usage. 
and um, yeah. But then, let's say an OpenShift this Go app would be like it would be started before the the where does it get before the service, right? So the 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 Go app the Go app would be the service, and then would would uh, yeah, and then would be and then would delegate the calls to the actual application server, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. The the proxy must be the facing uh, app, and uh, your your actual service uh, okay. or app must and be hidden from the outside because cool. Yeah, and this is co- this is called uh, called Keycloak Gateway. Gateway, yes. Already available. Already available. Yes. Exactly. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Never yeah. didn't know about that. So this is the reason why I do podcasts. Uh, you learned a lot. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, no, no, we have to, to promote it a bit more. But yeah, yeah. It's, cool. Uh, so, uh, so what it means is, uh, basically, what technically happens, the server will have to intercept the request because uh, it has to know, you know, the user is not uh, authenticated. Then what, what will happen as I think 401 has to, is, or uh, some HTTP status code is thrown as I think 401. And then a redirect yes. happens to the login, comes back yes. with a token, and then you are ready to go. So this is somehow complex flows, and there are different flows in OAuth too. So you have to decide which one, and this configuration can be complex. Yes, but uh, you, to be honest, you you can even if you don't know about these flows, uh, it's hidden for you for Keycloak. So uh, basically, uh, the main use case is you have a web app, mm-hmm. and there you use the Keycloak uh, JavaScript library, and you say just when I start my app, uh, check if I'm authenticated or not. Uh, if I'm not, uh, initiate the, the redirect flow. And uh, by default, it will use the authorization OS tool flow, uh, but you don't really have to care about that. And as a result, you just receive these tokens, and then from your web app, you make an HTTP request to your microservice. You just have to make sure to put, put the, the, the token in the header mm-hmm. of your request, uh, and that's it. Yeah. And on the other side, on the other side, your mar- for instance, your microservice, he, he, he captures your request and he checks for the header. He says, hey, there's an authorization uh, bearer token. Let me validate that. And uh, the adapter does that for you. And if it works, uh, your request goes on. Otherwise, it returns a, a 401 or a 403 if you're authenticated, but you don't have the rules, for instance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's 401 thing. It means you are not authenticated, so the flow happens, and 403 means you you are not authorized, right? Exactly. Yeah, perfect. So, and you're right. So I did it exactly. So in, I used the JavaScript library, and this did, I think the method was called login, and then you get redirected automatically, and if it uh, happens, you get back the uh, context with the token. You can send the token to the server, and the uh, server, oh. you have the adapter, and this basically it. But I was not happy because... Uh, I don't know whether you follow my things, and I don't like the dependency on vendors. I say, okay, the key clock is a standard, so what should work actually is we just use microprofile JSON web token with key clock. And, okay, yeah. And and this what we did then. Uh, this was in specific projects, so we used it back then an Apache with uh, with a module which I forgot, and this module was able. It was only aware of the OAuth two protocol. And it communicate with the backend, and then we got the token, and with the token, the JSON Web Token authentication worked out of the box, and um, and therefore I think I like the gateway thing because the gateway is actually would play the role of the Apache module, so the gateway would communicate and make the redirection, and then I don't need anything in the client because I only have to send the bearer token yeah. in the form of JSON Web Token back. To the server. Yes, exactly. Yes. So this is actually a great idea because then I'm I'm using Keycloak. I I use you know the Keycloak services, but I'm not binary dependent on Keycloak libraries, which is always a good idea because you know if you have lots of microservices and the Keycloak is going has to be upgrade, you will probably or potentially have to upgrade all your infrastructure. Exactly, and that, that that's true. That's true. And um, the other way of not being dependent of any Keycloak vendor library is, and it, that is what we are trying to move to is to, you could rely on generic OIDC libraries as well. There are, Keycloak is OIDC compliant, so that means that you could take any OIDC 
library for any technology and put that in your app and it should uh, work well as well uh, yeah, with your it worked in another yeah. project i can confirm that mm -hmm. it also worked and and, and the, the and the proof is, yeah, with with micro profile, the the Jot uh, extension, mm -hmm. um, it works. It works great with um, with Keycloak. I, yeah. I showed I showed that in in an application. Mm -hmm. Even I use it in in Quarkus. In Quarkus, you have also the the, the Jot extension for micro profile, and I show how Keycloak can works work with that. You saw a tool I wrote, Jotonizer. You saw that. Oh, Jotonize, no, no, I have to check I that. use it, uh, yeah, uh, could be useful. Uh, what I did, I created a small tool called Jotonizer, so JWTizer, it's on GitHub. And this is mm -hmm. uh, Java, uh, this is a, uh, a command line uh, interface, J Java jar. And what it yeah. does, it generates for you the private and public key. And from a, from a JSON file, it picks the roles and whatever payload you have and creates the JSON web token and also creates a micro profile config so you can copy and paste it to your server, and I use it for testing. So, uh, oh, you know, in test yeah. cases for my system tests, I can say, now I'm the admin, now I'm the guest, and so forth. And you know, so I can start, you know, the application override the public key of the security That's... on the microservice for my tests, and in production, it stays the same. Oh, yeah. But isn't, isn't that used for, to test uh, in, in Quarkus for the Jot extension? Isn't that used? Uh, maybe. maybe they use your could be maybe I'm not aware I'm, I'm of it. wondering because what I did yeah, I used yeah, yeah. I used uh, I, I recorded a screencast where I did it with Quarkus and maybe they used the extension just to and to test it uh, but it's not even extension what I created is a standalone um, command line interface yeah, yeah, yeah. where you can use whatever server you need and I use it in projects a lot because I get the question constantly you know uh, we have to how to test it, and uh, we need the user, and we need different roles, and we have to specify the roles in the system tests. And uh, this worked actually well. This is a very small library, and uh, somehow popular. So uh, yeah, good if you like. Okay, I will check it out yeah, because yeah, uh, you are right. We have the same questions. How do I test my? How do I write my test when I have uh, the security enabled, and uh, I don't want to start a keycloak server for that? And uh, so yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I will check that out. Yeah. So, uh, so really nice. So, uh, exactly. So, the future of of of, of Keycloak would be, uh, you get you know interesting services without being dependent on the binaries, which is a really good idea for. I mean, for I mean, it's just reasonable. You can call it cloud native or microservice. I would say it's just reasonable. Okay. Yes, um, yes. Now we have a JSON Web Token OAuth uh, two, and the question is. Uh, can we talk about the flow? So there are three flows. Do you remember them? Yeah, there's a uh, authorization flow, uh, the the implicit flow, yes. and the hybrid and the hybrid flow. Yeah. yeah. Can we just briefly talk about them? So the authorization flow. What happens briefly? So when you when you need it and what is it? Uh, the authorization flow is um, when you will uh, authenticate. There's an extra step in the authentication flow is that uh, the first time that you want to log in, the server sends you back a authorization code, that is an opaque code, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, really is a short lifespan. And uh, yeah, I I'm just simplifying that, but the yep. client has to confirm that authentication using that code. Mm -hmm. uh, and once that happens, um, uh, then you are really authenticated. So it's... Uh, it's that's defined by OS2. It's um, it's it's the more secure way to authenticate. Mm -hmm. uh, the implicit flow, uh, you skip the the authorization part, uh, uh, the authorization code part, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Um, and so you have less back and forth uh, during the authentication flow. And the hybrid flow, uh, <laughs> to be honest, I forgot a bit about that. You, you know, that, that's the problem working with Keycloak. You, it, it's all abstracted for you. And <laughs> if you don't, don't pay attention to it, you forget it yourself. So yeah. to be honest, the, this the is, hybrid uh, flow. Uh, yeah, exactly yeah. what happens with me if I, uh, with the Java E stuff. You don't have to deal, you know, with threads and synchronize and all this stuff. And sometimes yeah. I forget. So I have to relearn. So, okay, let's hack something crazy, you know, to. Yeah. Stay fit. Um, exactly. 
I just just wanted to 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 ask you about you know the use cases because what I remember the uh, there is one use case more for apps like like native apps and there's one use case more for web apps and uh, I think so this was just the generic question what when to use when but um, and yeah. Uh, and another concept you have to be aware of is that there is a session token where it extend and with the session token you get always get the new JSON web token. So this is like you have to decide how long uh remains your session valid or invalid. Exactly. Uh about the the session co uh well just to come back on OF two and open ID connect you and basically you get free tokens when you logged in. You mm -hmm. get uh an id token which is more or less your identity card it's what you will use on your web app to show information about your user mm -hmm. you get an access token that's mm -hmm. the token that you will use to call external services uh, and that token has a really short lifespan it's uh, five minutes by default you can mm -hmm. make it shorter in in keycloak if you want and therefore, you where, have the where to make it token. shorter on Keycloak. You do it shorter, or in the configuration of the client side? No, in the in the configuration of the Keycloak uh, console. Okay. So you say when you generate the token for me, please make it one minute long or five minutes long, okay. or mm -hmm. or some people want to have a long-lived token. That is also possible. But uh, the advice is to have a short lifespan of your access token, mm -hmm. and when it expired. Um, on the client side, you have the refresh token that you can use to obtain a new fresh access token. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you have to to bear in mind uh, the, the 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 token, the access token lives for five minutes, mm -hmm. and once your microservice or your service got this token, if it's compromised, uh, even if you log out to user. The service has still this token that that is living for five minutes, and it, it can use it to call another service that can just do an offline verification. And for the service, that token will still be valid. And you understand? So that is something you must be aware of. Uh, you you, mm -hmm. you then can, you can just, yeah. Uh, another question which comes uh, frequently: Let's imagine I have a scheduler which runs every five minutes. And the scheduler yeah. doesn't have a login, so you, I need an. Uh, what what I do then? Then you use a service account. So we have the concept of service account in Kiklo, mm -hmm. where an app can obtain itself a token. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, using uh, uh, using a, a password or a signed jot, we have different options. But basically, the app logs in to to Kiklo and asks for a token, and Kiklo gives him a token. So you don't have this whole login redirect flow without any user okay. um, human interaction. So the service account. A very good idea. Go. So the, the name is also good yeah. because it's uh, similar to uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift, also service accounts. It, exactly. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the very last question, and this is somehow related, how to log out. So what is actually the procedure if I would immediately log out and the token should be invalidated? Is it something? So for uh, we have a, a backend channel for logout. So when you install your your adapters, uh, it exposes a logout endpoint, and uh, from the user uh, from the admin user interface of Kiklo, at any moment you can say, okay, logout all the all the, the session of this client, and it will log out the client uh, the clients. So mm -hmm. um, that's a way to go. Uh, to be honest, for now, we are using more or less a homemade solution for that. There is a specification in the OpenID Connect for the global logout, uh, which is still in draft, I think, but we plan to uh, implement that uh, just to be uh, on spec. Um, and we also have another more or less custom-made uh, solution with where we can push a timestamp to all the, the the services that are connected to Keycloak, and once that timestamp is pushed, if we received a token, uh, if the timestamp doesn't correspond, we refuse that token. So that is a way to to uh, manage what I told you before. If 
the token live for five minutes and it's compromised and uh, we don't have a way to to uh, avoid a service to check that. If this time stamp is set, uh, then it will refuse the token. So okay. That's another, yeah. Yeah, because uh, low code is always uh, challenging because uh, the JSON web tokens, they are self-contained. So they are just yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah passed yeah. along and uh, everyone trusts if they are valid. Yeah. Exactly. And for the logout, for, uh, as I said, we, we integrate as much as possible with the underlying security uh, framework. So if you are in a servlet, for instance, you just do a request dot logout mm-hmm. and uh, it will be logged out. And well. in JAXRS, I could do it, I think, indirectly uh, injecting the HTTP request. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you just inject the, the HTTP servlet request, and yeah. then uh, on the request you'd call the logout, and that's good as well. Yeah, and this would also work with Keyclog. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Because then you would use the back channel, right? If I would call yeah. HTTP servlet request dot logout, yeah. yeah. uh, you wrapping the request with your uh, dynamic proxy, whatever, and then the 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 back channel kicks in. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is. Uh, they are actually uh, great news. What what we forgot to mention the last killer feature of Keycloak is um, this is the only place where the private key is stored, right? Without Keycloak, we will have you know to distribute the private key uh, among oh, yeah. multiple services. But now we have one private key which uh, is used to generate the JSON web tokens, and the public yes. key can be freely distributed uh, across all the microservices. Exactly, uh, it doesn't even have to be distributed. The the the, the client can. Uh, request the public key because it's 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 exposed uh, by Keycloak. The, everyone can access the public key. Mm-hmm. This would so, even uh, work with MicroProfile JSON Web Token. I think you can specify URL as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That works. Yeah, that's what I do. I specify the the JWQKS mm-hmm. uh, endpoint, mm-hmm. and then the the exten- uh, the, the MicroProfile extensions know where to grab the public key. That works. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So where the people can find you? So do you have on Twitter, GitHub, blog? Yeah, well, uh, the easiest way is uh, Twitter. So it's SEBI2706. So S-I-B-I-2706. Uh, uh, on GitHub, it's just Sebastian Blanc in mm-hmm. uh, all attached. And uh, yeah, I will be more than happy to, to help people get feedback and... Uh, and if it's more related to Keycloak, that is what I already always said. The best way to ask questions is on our mailing list. Perfect. Uh, and you send me please the uh, some links to the show notes regarding you know the gateway, prop- the proprietary yes. logout mechanism I put on to the show notes so the listeners can you know uh, look it up. Exactly. I will show. I will send you. So perfect. So what I would like to do is to invite you in a few months, weeks, or next year to talk about and more specifically about Keycloak, let's say, because we don't have yep. to introduce ourselves. Everyone knows that you already started with Thompson. So this was the <laughs> m- most important information. So thank you a lot. Yeah, thank you a lot, Adam. It was a pleasure.